And we're going to buy a pile ton of Kindles. Um, I've made some change to that form, and I can just submit it and post it back to Amazon.com. And it'll say, <laughs> sure, you can buy a pile ton of Kindles. <laughs> I, I recorded this video and then I went to do a bunch of shopping for Christmas and I went to check out and I was like, oh, my God, like 19 billion dollars. Um, this is sort of a contrived example. At the end of the day, Amazon will probably be really excited if you hack their website and order this many Kindles from them. But this kind of thing is really common in websites. Like that ability to modify a form and submit it. But the server is just like, hey, I gave you a form. I anticipate you'll send something back. I'm not doing anything to check and make sure that what I gave you is the same as what you sent back. So there, yeah, we kind of like set the stage a little bit. So let's talk about why Drupal's form API is mostly cool. Um, it helps solve a lot of those problems. I want to talk a little bit about how the whole system works before we get into the kind of how it solves those individual problems. When you think about somebody going to fill out a form on your website, this is the basic process, that, the whole workflow that it goes through. Somebody requests the URL. So they go to example.com slash contact or you know, whatever the form is on your site, node slash add slash article. <coughs> and the web server sends some HTML back to the browser. The browser says, hey, that's great. Um, I'm going to go ahead and display the form. So in this case, Drupal said, hey, you requested this URL. I'm going to figure out which module handles that URL. That module said I should display a form. Here's the form. Your browser displays it. Just the standard HTML form at this point. You fill it out and you hit the submit button at the end. So now your browser sends a post message back to the server. Um, and your server picks that up and it says, okay, I've got some incoming data in this request, and the request is still example.com slash contact. And so example.com slash contact, well, that's Drupal. Drupal will know how to deal with this. I'll let it do its thing. Drupal goes through the whole process of saying which module deals with this page. The module says, oh, there's a form on this page. Drupal says, well, I've got some post data right now, so instead of just this rendering the form and displaying it, maybe you want to process that incoming data. And then, before it does that, Drupal says, oh, maybe I'll validate that this is appropriate or safe data before I just hand it over to your module to mess with. So it performs some basic validation routines. And then it lets your module also perform some validation. At some point, Drupal says, oh, there is something wrong with this form. You got, forgot to fill out a field. You, uh, added too many Kindles to your shopping cart. You entered text into a field that should have contained a numeric value. Whatever the case may be, that same URL <coughs> rebuilds the form, Drupal rebuilds the entire form, highlights any fields in the form that have had errors set on it, and then sends the HTML back to your browser. Um, you ever go to a website and it's like, hey, sign up for this event. So you start filling out your user profile and you get to the end of the page and you hit submit and it's like, oh, sorry, you forgot to enter your email address and you're like, oh, crap. So you go enter your email address and it goes, oh, sorry, you forgot your phone number and you're like, oh, crap, here's my phone number. And that process of, like, it only validates one field at a time, um, that's a really common thing you see a lot too. Drupal provides tools to make it easy to validate the entire form. Like, build up a container of all the errors for that form and then send it back to the browser all at once. So you can say, well, you forgot your email address and your phone number, fix those two things and then submit the form. Eventually, um, hopefully, your users figure out how to fill out the form and click the submit button. Drupal actually can't control that aspect of it. Uh, once they do, <coughs> they send that data to Drupal a second time. This time it says, hey, the data validated. Um, that's awesome. I'm going to figure out what to do with this next. So you posted that form data back to the server, which said there's post data included in this request, hands it to Drupal, Drupal performs all of its validation, makes sure that it's the form matches and so forth, and once it's got all the data cleaned up and sanitized, it hands it to your module and says, here you go, do whatever it is you need to do. Save it to the database, send an email. Um, at that point, Drupal is allowing your module to react to whatever data was sent with that form. And that whole process in code looks something like this. Um, somewhere along the lines, some code in your 
Drupal code base, probably a module, definitely a module, it's the only way it could happen, called the Drupal get form function. And it identified the name of some form that it would like to create. So like a unique ID for this form. Um, in a roundabout way, what ends up happening is Drupal then asks your module for a definition of the form, or this dollar sign form variable, it's a big nested array that describes the form. It goes through that whole process of sending it to the user, rendering it as HTML, they submit the form and post it back. When they post it back, um, Drupal says, do this whole thing again. Call Drupal get form, build the form array. Wait, hold on a second. This time there's post data. It's going to perform that validation. If there are errors, it allows you to highlight them. If there are no errors, it calls an appropriate handler function to say, okay, here's the sanitized data. Let's go ahead and make use of it. And then after all that, you can tell Drupal, I'm done dealing with this incoming data. Do something else. Redirect to another page. Display this page again, whatever the case may be. And this is really cool because instead of what we saw with the sort of standard HTML forms, which were a little bit cumbersome to create and had lots of potential security issues, they're not issues if you remember to write the code. The issue is really you have to remember to write the code to make your form secure. With Drupal, you get an automatic workflow. Um, you get the opportunity to create essentially three different functions. One that builds the form, one that validates the form, and one that handles the already validated and sanitized data and just do whatever you want with it. So you've got this nice separation of concerns. And as long as you follow the naming pattern of these functions, Drupal will automatically call all of them for you. <coughs> you get a bunch of automatic security. That issue with local, or local modification <coughs> of the HTML, um, Drupal would never allow that to happen. You'll get a really great error message that says something along the lines of like, we're sorry, something went wrong. Please contact the administrator. You know, like, I am the administrator. What do you mean? Um, <laughs> basically, when Drupal builds that form and sends it to the user browser, it's also keeping a cached copy of the form in the database. So now, when I submit the form from my browser and send it back to Drupal, the very first thing that Drupal does is it compares the form you just submitted with the version that's in the database. And if they don't match, it fails out and does nothing else with the form. Um, so you can protect against things like that select list. It's making sure that the options that were in the select list when it's sent to the user are the same as the options that came back. Um, you get consistent HTML outputs from Drupal's form. So if we follow the patterns and build our form using Drupal's form API, every single text field will have the same output, HTML. It'll have the label appropriately, it'll have the tab index set, it'll have all the ARIA and 508 compliance stuff dealt with for you. Uh, they're all theme functions, so if you want to change it, you just modify that theme function in one place, and now you've updated the HTML across all of your models. Um, you have the ability to easily inject custom behaviors into not only your own forms, but any other form in Drupal as well. So, rather than, like, imagine the scenario where all of a sudden you have to try to add additional functionality to a hard-coded HTML form that was part of some other code base. The only possible way you can do it is modify that code. Uh, Drupal allows you to easily interact with other people's forms using special alter hooks and say, right before the form is sent to the user, Drupal says, does anybody else want to make changes to this form? Um, and if they do, you can add in, like, ah, I'd like to validate that in a different way. So maybe the common example would be, if you want to make some change to the user login form in Drupal and you want to validate that usernames are email addresses. It's really easy to write some additional code that adds an additional validation routine to that username field so that when they submit it, it runs your validation criteria and continues to run any existing validation criteria. <laughs> um, and then as we'll see at the end, the form API has some cool tools that allow you to easily um, bundle up complex logic into like a really simple, well, a really simple couple lines of code. Um, something like uh, a file upload widget or a five-star widget. If you think about like five-star rating on comments, that's really a form of some sort usually. Um, they're often like, if you turned off CSS in JavaScript, in a lot of cases what you end up seeing is a bunch of radio buttons. 
um, and clicking one of those buttons and submits the form and you're rating this somehow. But it's way cooler if it's actually a bunch of little flaming icons and you can click on the flame that corresponds to your level of hotness and then it submits that to the server instead. Uh, Drupal makes it easy to kind of write the code to do that once and then make it reusable across uh, all the forms on your site or even all the forms on anybody's site. So how does this all work? Where do forms come from? <laughs> We said that the doorway to the Drupal form API is the function Drupal underscore get underscore form. Uh, so you call this somewhere in your code, either as like part of an already existing page or a, a really common use case is like this is the page callback for some modules URL. You know, mysite.com slash contact, the PHP function to call when somebody views that page is Drupal get form and then the form ID is contact form or something along those lines. This function takes one argument and that's the unique ID of your form. Uh, this is important because that ID gets used in a bunch of different places. So when you're writing code for these, remember that and that it's probably best to namespace these to the name of your module. Because by using Drupal get form and specifying this unique form ID, I'm also telling Drupal the name of the function that it should use to build the form, validate the form, and deal with handling submitted data. So, and this is just those three functions, that's part of that automatic workflow. Drupal will call a function that is named my form ID uh, with two arguments, and that, that function is responsible for basically describing the form to Drupal. And then, so that one's required. The other two, validation and submission, are uh, optional. I don't know why you would give someone a form that they couldn't submit, but if you want to, you could. Um, if these functions exist, following the naming convention, which is your, the unique ID of your form, underscore validate or underscore submit, Drupal will take care of automatically calling those for you. The function that builds that form and kind of what how this what this looks like in code. Uh, we're not you know um, the form building function creates a dollar sign form array, which is a large nested array, a Drupal, um, that describes all of the fields on that form, and they look a lot like this. There's a couple of things to keep in mind when you're looking at one of these form API arrays. Um, there's this concept of properties and elements. You think of an element as being any individual field or widget that's going to be, end up eventually being displayed as something on the page. And then the properties are any key in this array that starts with the pound symbol as a property, and they are describing that element to Drupal. So the example at the bottom here is we have a new element named form and then a bunch of properties that tell Drupal this element with the name of form is a text field. It has a title of name. Uh, we're going to set it to have a default value um, and then we're marking it as required. That's just an example of the types of properties that you can use for an element in a form array. And what Drupal will end up doing when it's getting ready to display that form for the user, it takes that information contained in the pound properties and translates that into the HTML that the browser needs to display the form. So this text field, Drupal was able to take that array and translate it into this HTML for us. It knew that I wanted a text field. It knew that it should have a label of name. It knew that um, it's required, so it's gonna add the little red asterisk next to the uh, label there. Um, we could probably spend the rest of the year going over all of the properties that are available in the form API. We're not going to do that. Um, so suffice it to say there's a lot of them. They're used to describe an element to Drupal so that Drupal knows how to translate that element into HTML. And also so it knows a little bit about how to deal with that element once it's submitted. For example, marking something is required, Drupal will make sure that when the form submitted, that field contains a value. If you want to learn more about the form API, you can go to uh, api.drupal.org. 
And these two links are really, really useful. The one under the a few components of Drupal, called form generation, um, walks through a lot of the workflow that we just talked about. All the functions that get called, what order they get called in, how to name your functions, and so forth. And then the second one, down at the bottom of the page, this is the forms API reference. Um, arguably the most useful page in all of Drupal's documentation. And what it does is it gives you a big, giant table um, of all of the element types. Um, so pound type is a property, and then you have to specify an element type, and that's the sort of base determinant of what sort of widget to display for the user. Is it a text field? Is it a checkbox? Is it a radio button? Well, probably not just one radio button. That's is it a set of radio buttons? Um, and there's a bunch of different types. And then listed down the column on the left is all the different properties that the form API knows about. And then it shows you at the intersection, this property applies to this type of form field. Um, you can click on either a type or a property. And when you do so, it'll give you more information about that property. Um, and this is really cool. For all the properties, it gives a like real-world example of how you could use that property. Um, so it's great, like you get a description of what this thing does, a list of all of the types that this is applicable for, and then a real-world example that you can pretty much just copy and paste and say, cool, I know how to make use of this now. Um, most properties deal with are suitable to sort of flag values, like yes, turn this thing on, no, don't. This thing is of type password field or of type file field. Um, this element is required. Some are a little bit different though, so careful or watch out for these. Oh, didn't have highlighting, sad. Um, some properties accept a string or an array of strings that are the name of a function to call in order to do something on that element. So this is a good example of the pound element underscore validate property. I give it the name of a, a PHP function that I'd like to call. When that form gets submitted um, and Drupal goes through all of its validation routines, it recognizes that I've added an additional validation function for just this one element. So it should call that function, do whatever that function does. Um, if the function sets an error, I've set an error on the form. If it passes validation, great, like continue processing. There's a handful of other properties that work in this way where you, you give it the name of a function to call and it turns around and on submission or, or there are some that also deal with when this element is being rendered into HTML, call this function as part of that processing workflow. Um, there's also like, there's basic properties that control like how something gets rendered. So, you know, is this a text field? Is this a radio button? Uh, what should I do when it's submitted? There's also a lot of things in the form API to sort of help make common user interface patterns easier. Um, a really common example of that is there's a, a form API element that is the table select element. So if you've ever used Drupal and you've been to the content page where it's got a big list of all the nodes on your site and a checkbox for each one, and you can select like however many checkboxes in that table, and then publish them or unpublish them. Um, you can also do some other really cool things with that table that a lot of people don't know, but you can like select one checkbox, hold down the shift key, select another one halfway down the page, and it'll highlight all, or it'll select all of them in between. So some cool things like that that are complicated to write all of the code to do it. Drupal is encapsulated into really simple um, properties in the form API. Another example of that is the pound states property. This is how you deal with that scenario of um, I've got a checkbox that when somebody clicks on it, I'd like to expose three more fields on the form for collecting additional information. Or when they set their state to Minnesota, I'd like to change the list of cities to contain cities in Minnesota. Um, and this one, I point this one out because it's a little bit it works a bit different than all the others in that you set a bunch of information in the pound states property, and what it ends up doing is the form API actually deals with 
writing all of the JavaScript that's necessary in order to perform that like dependent dropdown or hide and show form depending on the value of a field, some other field. Um, and this is cool because this this stuff it's, it's not hard to do if you know jQuery, but it's really easy to mess it up because it's so simple and you've done it so many times. It's really easy to like miss one of the ten steps that's required. Um, same with Ajax, it will provide some functionality to make it pretty easy to create a form that when you click the button, it'll do an Ajax request and call some PHP function in the background. Just with you adding like the pound Ajax property and a couple of additional elements. <coughs> Again, like if you know jQuery, not really hard to deal with, um, but it's nice because you don't have to deal with writing all of the code. Drupal takes care of that on your behalf. Apparently I have a slide for that too. Like this. Um, if you've ever heard, if you think about like all how the form API works and this thing where Drupal builds the form, but it also keeps a cached version of that form. It sends the form to the user, user fills it out, sends it back, and then Drupal compares the version that just came back with the cached version. That is affected in this, like, if you're trying to do Ajax operations on a form, think about what would happen if you had jQuery make a request to Drupal that brought back some information, and then you use JavaScript to change some element on the form. You change the list of values available in the you know, country select list based on, well, that wouldn't make sense, in the state select list based on the country that somebody chose. You've just effectively performed local modification on that form via your own JavaScript. So Drupal <coughs> Ajax uh, command by using this public Ajax not only deals with writing the JavaScript for you, but it also deals with when the Ajax request is made, it pulls the form out of the cache, rewrites the form as necessary, sticks it back into the cache, and then sends you the updated form elements. So that when somebody submits the form, the two things match and you don't get a validation error. Pretty cool. Um, and then it gets complicated, if that wasn't complicated enough. One of the things that's really cool about the form, I keep saying that. One of the things that's really handy about the form API <laughs> is this ability to encapsulate complex logic into simple like element types. The managed file element is a good example of this. It's provided by Drupal core. <coughs> um, it sets a whole, I make a new form element and it's like, you know, file upload is pound type managed file and set a title and that it's required. In the background, Drupal is setting defaults for all of these other properties on a managed file element. And it's adding a bunch of JavaScript and a bunch of callback functions, performing a bunch of operations so that what my user sees is a simple <coughs> upload form. And this is pretty easy to add to the page. It's an upload form with a little bit of information about what kind of file you can upload. But this upload form also has built-in validation, so it'll make sure that the file is less than 32 megabytes. It'll also make sure that the file is one of the allowed types. It also will allow you to upload the file via Ajax, and it'll display a progress meter or a little spinny icon, depending on which you've indicated you'd like to use. Um, so a lot of that stuff that you don't have to write the code over and over, you just need to specify, I'd like to use the managed file upload element and for my particular use case, I want to change these two defaults. Um, so five lines of code, and you've got a like fully Ajax-enabled file upload with a progress bar and all kinds of whiz-bang features. Again, same thing that we talked about with that five-star element. You could encapsulate that logic into a reusable form element. Um, because of the fact that these forms in Drupal are all described as giant nested arrays, it's really easy for someone else's code to make modifications to our form. Or for, my, for me to write code that makes modifications to somebody else's form. Um, this is effectively how like, the field system in Drupal 7 works. There's a base node form, form alter. So it alters the node form, and it says, based on the configuration I found in the database, I need to add all these additional elements or fields to this node form. Um, 
This is how you, as a module developer, or as a themer, because these are actually the form alter hooks that are available to themes as well, um, give you the opportunity to do things like change the label on a form to something different, or more, change the description so that it's more appropriate for your use case. Uh, you can remove form fields altogether. You can add validation to form fields. Basically, as long as somebody, that other piece of code is using Drupal's form API in order to build the forms, I have the ultimate, uh, ultimate, I have the ability to control anything that that form does, just like as if it was form that I had written myself. Uh, which means I don't have to like modify somebody else's module just to add a simple little bit of extra logic to what happens when they submit the form. So that's building forms. Um, validate and submit handlers for forms. These are, this is part of that automatic workflow. It's based on the naming convention. So I've said, I called the function Drupal get form, and I've given it the name of my form. If the validate and submit functions exist, Drupal will automatically call them for me. And in that, both of those functions, I get two arguments passed in. The first one, that dollar sign form variable, is the definition of the form that was created and shown to the user. And now I have the definition of that form again, so I can make use of it when performing validation or when dealing with submitted data for that form. And then there's this dollar sign form state array. The form state array, probably the most useful part of that is the values key. Um, and this is important because in, if you're using Drupal's form API correctly, you shouldn't ever access post data directly from the dollar sign underscore post, like super global. You should access it from the form state array in your validate or submit handler because Drupal's already performed some basic data sanitization on that for you. And then you can set errors on a form element. You can save that information to the database and redirect to another page. Basically, form state controls um, the workflow and operation of that form. Um, so basically, everything that has to do with processing the form's data, we want to work with the form state array. All right, so that was a lot of stuff. Uh, the gist of it is, if you want to use the form API, Drupal get form is your gateway into making use of that system. Uh, use that function to start the building of a form. Um, Drupal automates the workflow and performs a lot of operations for us automatically as long as we're using the form API. My module needs to create the actual form by building that form array. Um, my module also needs to perform validation and submission, like handling that submitted data. But Drupal will deal with all the like figuring out how to display it to the user and the URL and all of that stuff. Um, and then I have this ability to, at the end, modify other people's forms as long as they're using the system, um, which is, at the end of the day, I think one of the things that makes Drupal, um, well, it's what makes Drupal possible, it's also what makes it as powerful as it is as a content management system. So that's the form API in a nutshell. Um, questions? <laughs> I work with the form API in Drupal 6 and Drupal 7, uh -huh. and I found out that the syntax is uh, quite different of the PHP functions and the well rendering the form and that kind of stuff. Uh, but Drupal 8 is it going to change as well uh, regard to the syntax? Yeah. So the question was um, the syntax of like the the functions that get automatically called is a, is different between Drupal 6 and Drupal 7. Um, is that going to change as well from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8? Um, not as much from what I've seen. Um, I haven't kept up with it a ton. Um, I'm sure it will change some, yes. You're, you're going to have to make sure. The function signatures, as far as I know, are still the same. Um, Drupal 8 will add new properties that just weren't available in Drupal 7 for forms, form API arrays and that kind of stuff. But it, right now, the overall workflow is still very similar. Thanks. Uh, I'm being giving the signal that we need to wrap things up. So if you have additional questions, um, I can hang out up here for a couple of minutes and be happy to answer them. And help yourself to a sparkly pony or a robot. Thank you. Thank you.